Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Fahad Ansari and I'm here to help you conquer chemistry. We will inshallah try to cover all of AS level organic chemistry within 90 minutes. So before we begin, make sure you like this video and do subscribe to the channel. Now let's get started. So there are many different types of aliphatic and aromatic hydrocarbons. So this question wants us to name a source of these hydrocarbons and outline how they are separated. So if you haven't already guessed by now, the source of these hydrocarbons is crude oil. And the outline of the separation of hydrocarbons, well, there's a simple separation process known as fractional distillation. And fractional distillation works because these different hydrocarbons are in fractions having different boiling points. So you heat up the crude oil and the vapors then condense on different trays uh, depending on how high or how low the boiling points of these fractions are. So this is fractional distillation. So when alkenes are heated to high temperatures in the absence of air, the molecules can break into smaller molecules. So when you're breaking hydrocarbons into smaller molecules, this reaction is known as cracking. And there are two types of cracking. There's thermal cracking and catalytic cracking. So if you want to be highly specific of the type of cracking over here, you may notice that in this question, the alkanes have been heated to high temperatures in the absence of air, and there's no mention of a catalyst, so it is thermal cracking. If it was catalytic cracking, they might have mentioned a catalyst like uh, Al2O3 or another catalyst which is known as zeolite. So write an equation which describes the reaction occurring when heptane C7816 is heated in the absence of air to form three products. We have hexane, butane, and ethene. So heptane, we have C7H16. This is cracked to give you hexane, which is C6H14, plus butane, which is C4H10. And then you have ethene, which is an alkene, so this is C2H4. So you can notice on the right-hand side, you have more carbon atoms than on the left-hand side. So we have two heptanes, so that gives us 14 carbon atoms. And on the right-hand side, you have 6 plus 4 plus 2, so that's 12. To get it up to 14, we can have a 2 in front of 18. And just to confirm, we have 2 times 16, that's 32 hydrogen atoms. On the LHS, on the RHS, we have 14 plus 10 plus 2 times 4, that's also 32. So, most vehicle fuels contain hydrocarbons obtained from crude oil. State the name of the type of reaction that hydrocarbons undergo when being used as fuels. So, fuels are substances that release energy, right? And energy can be released from a reaction known as combustion. So, the fuel is reacted with oxygen from the air, and that gives you certain products. Depending on the type of combustion, you could have either complete combustion in an excess of oxygen, or you could have incomplete combustion when there is a lack of oxygen. So it says write an equation for the reaction of octane used as a fuel in the previous part. So they haven't uh, basically specified which type of combustion they need. So we'll go for complete combustion. So C8H18, this will react with oxygen and you will get two products from complete combustion, which are CO2 and H2O. So we have eight CO2, we have nine H2O, and when we balance this equation, this comes out to be 25 over two O2. Now, if I wanted incomplete combustion, instead of CO2, I would get CO, carbon monoxide, and water vapor would also be there. So if I write the equation for this, just need to balance it a little differently. So I have 8CO, I have 9H2O, and now 
Instead of 25 over 202, I will have 17 over 202. So you can see over here that uh, previously we had 12.5 moles of oxygen. Over here, we just have 8.5 moles of oxygen. So you decreased the amount of oxygen available and you went from complete to incomplete combustion. So in this question, we have placed hexane, which is an alkane, uh, with aqueous bromine, Br2, uh, under two sets of conditions, either in the dark or in sunlight. And you can see the difference in observations that bromine is added to hexane, either in the dark or in sunlight. So in the dark, there is no change. The mixture remains orange due to the aqueous bromine. And in the sunlight, the color of the mixture fades to pale yellow. That means that the bromine has reacted. So the test tube in the dark is kept cool and is not exposed to ultraviolet light. Explain the observations. So basically, the observation is explained because there's no reaction, right? There's no reaction because the reaction between hexane and bromine hexane is c6h14 and bromine is initiated only under uv light so when there's no uv light when it is completely dark the reaction won't even start. It won't be initiated. So in the sunlight, the reaction that occurs between bromine and hexane occurs via a mechanism, and that mechanism is free radical substitution. So there are three steps in this uh, mechanism, right? The first step is initiation. The beginning of this reaction requires ultraviolet light. And what happens is that the halogen molecule, in this case bromine, will undergo a type of bond breaking which is known as homolytic fission. So in homolytic fission, the uh, bond pair breaks or is distributed such that each atom gets one electron from the bond pair. And so both atoms will have one unpaired electron and uh, that is why these species are known as free radicals containing this unpaired electron. So give an equation which shows a propagation step in this reaction in which hexane produces this. So this big fella over here is the hexyl free radical. So basically this is hexane with one hydrogen removed. And one of the carbon atoms contains this dot over here, which is an unpaired electron, which makes it highly reactive. So hexane is going to react with a bromine free radical, so Br dot, uh, which comes up from the initiation step. And this is going to produce a new molecule and a new free radical. The new molecule is HBr. And the new free radical is, surprise, surprise, the hexyl free radical that was asked for. All right, it loses one hydrogen uh, to HBr and it forms this hexyl free radical. So the next step, the hexyl free radical will react with a bromine molecule that did not undergo homolytic fission in the first step. And so this is going to give us one bromohexane, this is C6H13Br, and the other product will be a bromine free radical. So you can see in the first propagation step, this was a propagation step which used up a bromine free radical from the initiation step. Then in the next propagation step, the bromine free radical that was used up is regenerated. And so this bromine free radical can attack another hexane molecule and this process can keep repeating itself until termination which is step number three in this mechanism takes place in which 
Now you're going to have two free radicals that come together to form one molecule and no further free radicals that can continue this reaction. So over here, termination step that produces one bromohexane. We could have a hexyl free radical C6H13 that reacts with a bromine free radical. And this could give you just one molecule, which is C6H13Br. This is your product, one bromohexane. And no further free radicals are produced. No more alkane molecules will be attacked. So this was free radical substitution with three steps. We had initiation, we had propagation. Propagation always occurs in pairs of reactions like this, as we have seen over here. And then we have third step, which is termination. So now we shall move on to alkenes. So let's move on to alkenes. So in this question, we have two hydrocarbons, A and B. The formula is given. And they're both unbranched and it says that a does not decolorize bromine but b does so if b decolorizes bromine this is a well-known test for the carbon carbon double bond this shows that b has a carbon carbon double bond mm -hmm. and so a does not have this carbon carbon double bond and the formula c4h10 also fits in with the general formula for an alkane, which is CnH2n plus 2. So A is an alkane. So draw the skeletal formula of A. So the skeletal formula, we know that we just show the bonds between the carbon atoms. We do not show the carbon atoms themselves, nor the hydrogen atoms, nor the bonds between carbon and hydrogen. So we know that there are four carbon atoms and there are a total of three single bonds between them so one two three and each corner represents a carbon atom so this corner this this and this all of these are carbon atoms so this is c4h10 it says that b shows geometrical isomerism so geometrical isomerism is also known as cis trans isomerism and for this to occur, first of all, we need the carbon-carbon double bond, which is present over here. It's carbon-carbon double bond. And uh, each of these two carbon atoms in the double bond needs to be bonded to two different groups. In this case, we will have hydrogen and we will have a methyl group. So we have this is the structure of B over here. So you can see that this is four carbon atoms and 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 that is 8 hydrogen atoms so this is the structure of b by the way you can see that both the hydrogen atoms are on the same side of the carbon carbon double bond so this is known as the cis isomer for the trans isomer you need to rotate one of the carbon atoms in the double bond so that the hydrogen goes on to the other side so you have both hydrogens on opposite sides of the carbon-carbon double bond. And the rest is obviously going to be CH3 and CH3. So if you've already given the structural formula of B, this will just be CH3, CH. You could show the double bond if you want between these two carbon atoms. Or you could omit that and then we have CH3. Explain why B shows geometrical isomerism. So there are two reasons. One, we have the carbon-carbon double bond. We know that uh, each carbon atom in the double bond is further bonded to two different groups. All right, now the next step is to look at the uh, addition reactions of alkenes. We know that alkenes, they react with uh, four different reactants. So first is the halogens and hydrogen and hydrogen halides, an example of which we will do right now. And the fourth 
is going to be steam. So alkenes undergo addition reactions with all of them, and the mechanism is actually called electrophilic addition. So in this case, an electrophile is obviously going to be an electron deficient species. And uh, we're going to show just how using this example. So we know that this hydrogen halide, hydrogen bromide, has a partial positive hydrogen and a partial negative bromine. This partial positive hydrogen, this, ladies and gentlemen, is your electrophile. This is attracted to the electron-rich carbon-carbon double bond over here, uh, so much so that uh, it gains the electron pair from the pi bond in this double bond, which is shown using a curly arrow from the source, which is the pi bond, to the destination, the partial positive hydrogen atom, the destination of this pair of electrons. And then this HBr bond undergoes heterolytic fission. Uh, both electrons in this uh, single bond go to the electronegative bromine atom. So this bromine atom becomes a bromide ion. All right. And over here, we have an intermediate. And in this intermediate, one of the carbon atoms in what was the double bond will bond to the electrophile, which is hydrogen. And the other will get a positive charge because this pi bond was a pair of electrons, originally one belonging to this carbon on the left and one to the right. Uh, so when this pi bond breaks, uh, effectively, one of the carbons loses an electron and gains a positive charge. It's going to be this one. And the other one will bond to the hydrogen. And uh, the bromide ion will attack the positive carbon atom. So it is a source of this lone pair of electrons. The destination is the positive carbon atom. Now, how did I decide which carbon atom gets bonded to the hydrogen? Well, you can see that this carbon atom was already bonded to two hydrogen atoms, whereas the other carbon atom in that previous double bond is not bonded to any hydrogens. So the hydrogen in hydrogen bromide will bond to the carbon that's already bonded to two hydrogen atoms. This is known as Markovnikov's rule. And the reason why we follow this rule is because the intermediate formed over here uh, has a carbon atom with a positive charge that is bonded to one, two, three alkyl groups, all of which have a special property that they are electron donating. So this uh, results in these alkyl groups uh, pushing their bond pairs towards the positive carbon so that the positive charge density goes down, stability increases. This over here is a tertiary carbocation which is so-called because we have three alkyl groups bonded to the positive carbon atom. This is going to be more stable than any other type of carbocation. If the hydrogen were bonded to this carbon atom instead, and this carbon atom got a positive charge, then we will get a carbocation that looks like this. We have CH over here and C positive over here. So now this positive carbon atom, instead of being bonded to three carbon atoms, is bonded to just one carbon atom. So one alkyl group. So this results in a less positive inductive effect. And so this is less stable because the charge density does not go down as much. It stays high. It stays less stable and more reactive. And the point of any chemical reaction is to achieve stability. If you can't do that, well, what's the point? So this is a primary carbocation that is less stable than a tertiary carbocation because of a greater positive inductive effect. So I've already explained this. I shall be moving on. It says that A and B are different straight chain alkenes with molecular formula C6H12. A does not show stereoisomerism. A reacts with potassium manganate 7 to form hexane 1,2-diol. Right, so now we need the structural formula of A. 
So first let's draw hexane 1 to diol. This has six carbon atoms uh, in a straight chain. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the first two carbon atoms are bonded to OH groups. And we have single bonds between them. So this uh, diol over here uh, results from the oxidation reaction with this uh, oxidizing agent. And uh, if you try to reverse this, these OHs will go away and you'll have a double bond between these two carbon atoms. And so the structural formula of A turns out to be something that looks a lot like this. So I could write this as CH2, double bond, CH, that this is going to be CH2, 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 CH3. And this I would name as hex1ene because uh, the carbon atom number one is where the double bond starts. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six carbon atoms in this trait chain. So the conditions for this reaction uh, are to be cold dilute KMnO4. But if we have hot concentrated acidified KMnO4 or potassium manganese 7, could have different reactions. And that really depends on the structure of the alkene. So for alkene X over here, we know that in the double bond, one of the carbon atoms is bonded to two hydrogen atoms. And so this carbon atom, once this double bond breaks or ruptures because the hot concentrated acidified KMnO4, this carbon will oxidize to carbon dioxide. And the other carbon atom is bonded to two methyl groups, two CH3s. So when this bond ruptures, this carbon atom will bond to an oxygen and it will form this ketone over here. So this is the structure of X. Now for the structure of Y, we have one carbon atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms that produces carbon dioxide and the other is a carbon atom that is bonded to one hydrogen and one alkyl group. In this case, it's going to be CH3, CH2 because when this carbon atom uh, gets free from the ruptured double bond, it's going to bond, double bond with an oxygen, and then between the C and the H, you're going to get another oxygen to make a carboxylic acid with the CO2H functional group. Then the final product uh, from the oxidation is going to be CH3CO2H, and for this, we know that both carbon atoms at the double bond of Z bonded to a hydrogen and a methyl group. So this carbon atom is oxidized to a carboxylic acid, and this other carbon atom will also be oxidized to the same carboxylic acid. So deduce the molecular formula of X, Y, and Z. So we have four carbon atoms, so it's going to be C4, and we have eight hydrogen atoms, so it's going to be eight, so C4H8. Another reaction that alkenes undergo is addition polymerization. And uh, over here we have a repeat unit of an addition polymer, right? These two carbon atoms are basically going to form a double bond between them. When these two continuation bonds going out of the brackets of the repeat unit come together, you get a double bond. And so you have this carbon-carbon double bond and uh, the other bonds are with hydrogen atoms, except for one that is with a COONA. So that's going to be the structural formula of the monomer Y that polymerizes by addition polymerization thanks to this carbon-carbon double bond to form a polymer that has carbon-carbon single bonds. All right, so enough about alkenes. Now let's move on to halogenoalkanes. All right, let's talk about halogenoalkanes. So some reactions based on one bromobutane are shown. So this guy over here is one bromobutane. And we can see a total of six reactions, starting with this fellow right here. 
So now for each reaction, we need to write the reagents and conditions and the type of reaction, right? And uh, now we will start re with reaction one and work our way down the list. So in reaction one, you can see that the uh, bromobutane over here, the bromine atom in one bromobutane is substituted by this alcohol group. So the functional group is being substituted. So this is going to be a substitution reaction, right? And the reagents for this condition are sodium hydroxide in aqueous solution and you will require heat under reflux. The reason why we do this is so that the one bromobutane, which is volatile, its vapors do not escape the uh, reaction flask before they have completely reacted. So there's a condenser at the mouth of the flask so that the vapors condense back and complete the reaction to be converted into butane one all over here. We have four carbon atoms, right? So there's one over here, three over here. So this is actually butane one all. Right, so now reaction two. So in reaction two, you can see that uh, the bromobutane is being converted into an alkene. So what happens over here is that you have CH3, CH2, CH2, and CH2, Br. So what happens in this reaction is that the H Br over here is eliminated, right? So this over here is called an elimination reaction because a small molecule, in this case hydrogen bromide, is eliminated. And uh, as a result, between these two carbon atoms over here, the carbon bonded to the halogen atom and the neighboring carbon atom, which carries a hydrogen, this will basically form a double bond between these two carbon atoms. And uh, for this, we will also use sodium hydroxide, but the difference is that this is going to be dissolved in an alcohol, specifically ethanol. So we call this ethanolic sodium hydroxide, and this will be also carried out using heat under reflux. So now reaction three over here. So you can see that one bromobutane is being converted into um, a compound over here that contains this functional group. This is the nitrile group. And over here we have one followed by three and then a fourth carbon atom, actually a fifth carbon atom. We have four plus one, that's five. So this actually results in a new compound called pentane nitrile, right? This is the nitrile functional group. For this, we will use KCN, which is also ethanolic. It is dissolved in ethanol, and we will use heat under reflux once again. And this type of reaction where the functional group, the halogen atom, is being substituted by a new functional group over here. This is going to be called substitution. Once again. Onwards to reaction four. Now nitriles, they can undergo one reaction that uh, you guys have studied, which is hydrolysis. Basically what happens is that in the nitrile functional group, this triple bond breaks and this is converted into a carboxylic acid group over here. And the nitrogen over here is converted into ammonia, right? Now, depending on the conditions of uh, this hydrolysis over here, this reaction force hydrolysis. Now, if you have an alkali, such as NaOH uh, with this hydrolysis, the carboxylic acid will react with the alkali to form a salt. But because over here in this product, you have a carboxylic acid group and not the salt of a carboxylic acid, we, it is safe to assume that we are going to use acid. 
So we have an asset such as HCL and we are going to use, surprise, surprise, heat under reflux. Right, now onwards to reaction five over here. So reaction five basically involves the alcohol butan one all that we came up with over here. Now this is being converted such that the OH is being converted into this group over here, which is the aldehyde group, right? So in this aldehyde, we basically have one followed by two, so that's three and four carbon atoms. And this is an aldehyde group, so this is basically going to be butanol. All right. Now, to convert butanol to butanol, this is an oxidation reaction, right? And you're going to use an oxidizing agent such as uh, KMnO4, right? So we can use acidified KMnO4 for this. And this is going to be using heat. And in order to ensure that the aldehyde does not oxidize further, uh, we would want to distill this product, right? So we want to make sure that the aldehyde form is immediately distilled so that it's not further oxidized, right? So heat followed by distillation. And if you do want it to be further oxidized, we have reaction six right here for you. This is going to convert the aldehyde group into a carboxylic acid group over here. And over here we have one, two, three, four carbon atoms. So this is basically butanoic acid. So butanoic acid is formed by further oxidation of butanol. And in this case, again, you're going to use KMnO4, which is acidified, or you could use K2Cr2O7, which is potassium dichromate 6. And over here, instead of distilling the product, you want to make sure that the product is completely oxidized to the carboxylic acid. And so, this will be heat under reflux yet again. Right. And uh, in case you didn't notice already, in reaction 4, uh, you didn't get butanoic acid. You got one three, that's four, and five. This is actually five carbon atoms, so this is pentanoic acid. So if you want to make a carboxylic acid with one more carbon atom than the halogenoalkane, which is one bromobutane, which has four carbon atoms, right? Which has four carbon atoms. You want an additional carbon atom, so you replace the bromine with a nitrile group using reaction three that we have already discussed. And then you could hydrolyze it to get a carboxylic acid with that additional carbon atom. So state the reagents and conditions needed for um, this halogenoalkane, which is, once again, one bromobutane to react to form. Over here, this is actually, we have one, three, that's four, four carbon atoms. So this is going to be butyl amine, right? Now this amine over here is basically this functional group over here. And for this, we will use ethanolic ammonia, right? And the conditions would be heat under pressure. Basically, you will heat the two reactants together in a sealed reaction vessel so that the reaction can be completed. Now the mechanism for all of these reactions uh, that you have seen so far of halogenoalkanes, the substitution reactions, are e either of two mechanisms. The first one we will study is SN2, right? So over here we have um, basically one bromobutane once again. This is being converted into butan one all, right? So for this, what we will do is that we have the OH negative uh, ion, the hydroxide ion from NaOH aqueous, uh, which is our nucleophile, right? This is a nucleophile. This is electron-rich, 
and it is attracted to the partial positive carbon atom in the carbon halogen bond. This is partial negative, and so it has a lone pair that attacks the partial positive carbon atom in the carbon halogen bond. The carbon halogen bond undergoes what we call heterolytic fission, right? Heterolytic fission basically involves both electrons in the bond going to the more electronegative bromine atom, right? Now, this halogenoalkane over here is a primary halogenoalkane. The reason why is because the carbon atom that is bonded to the halogen atom over here is bonded to two hydrogen atoms and only one carbon atom in this R group. This R group, as given in the question, is basically CH3, CH2, CH2, right? So this is a primary halogenoalkane that undergoes SN2, right? Now, they have given the product directly, but actually this mechanism consists of two steps. The first step basically yields an intermediate over here with the carbon atom that's bonded to the halogen bonded to five groups at the same time including the halogen atom and the new nucleophile so these two bonds are weak right now this bond between carbon and OH is being made and the bond between carbon and bromine is being formed this intermediate has on it a negative charge overall because of the OH that has been added to it. And uh, this intermediate is then converted into the final product. Now the reason why we call this SN2, SN basically stands for substitution, that's S, and N stands for nucleophilic. So this is nucleophilic. And the two basically means that in the first step of this mechanism, which happens to be the slow step of this mechanism, it depends on the concentration of not just the halogenoalkane, but also of the nucleophile, right? So there are two reactants in the slow step of this mechanism, which is also known as the rate determining step. We call this the rate determining step or RDS. And the rate of the slow step depends on the concentration of the nucleophile as well as the primary halogenoalkane, and so that's why you call it SN2. But if we have a tertiary halogenoalkane, now this is one where we have a carbon atom that's bonded to one, two, three other carbon atoms, the carbon atom that's bonded to the halogen atom. So in this case, what happens is in the first step, the CBr bond is going to break heterolytically we have a partial negative here, partial positive on the carbon. And so this is going to give us an intermediate whereby the carbon atom that was once bonded to the halogen has a positive charge. Now this is a tertiary carbocation. We already discussed this in alkenes. We know this is highly stable due to the electron donating effect of not just one but three alkyl groups. So this is pretty stable. And then this is going to attract the hydroxide ions over here uh, with the lone pair, negative charge, which are electron rich. It's going to attack the carbocation over here and you're going to get CH3, 3COH, right? You have three methyl groups bonded to the carbon, bonded to the OH, the new nucleophile. So the mechanism for this reaction is SN1. The reason why is because step one of this mechanism, which is once again the slow or rate determining step, is dependent not just on the concentration of the nucleophile, it's only dependent on one thing, the concentration of just the halogenoalkane. No nucleophiles are involved in the first step here. So this is going to be SN1. So in this question, um, basically we have reacted three halogenoalkanes, one containing chlorine, one containing bromine, and one containing iodine. Uh, these have been reacted with silver nitrate and ethanol, 
right? Basically what happens is that the ethanol that reacts with each of these halogen alkanes has an OH that substitutes the halogen atom over here. And so this is released into solution as a negative ion. The negative ion reacts with silver nitrate and so this gives us a precipitate. Such as in the case of chloride ions, this is going to give us a white precipitate. And in the case of bromide ions, this would be a cream precipitate. In the case of iodide ions, this will be yellow. And it says that the time taken for the precipitate to form for the iodoalkane, the halogenoalkane containing iodine, is the lowest. Basically, the reaction is the fastest. The reason why is because when you go from chlorine to iodine, the bond length incre increases and the uh, strength of the bond decreases. And so it's easier to break this halogen carbon bond. And so the reaction proceeds faster, right? So we have a weaker carbon halogen bond due to greater bond length and this bond length increases going from Cl to I, right? And so this is more easily broken and so the reaction happens faster. So let's talk about alcohols now. So we have two alcohols, V and W, given to us. And uh, it suggests name the class of compound that V and W each belong to. So why do we call them alcohols? Because of this OH group over here. That's the functional group for an alcohol. So both of them are alcohols, but what type of alcohol are they? So in the case of V over here, you can see that the OH group is bonded to a carbon atom that is bonded to just one other carbon and two hydrogen atoms. So this kind of alcohol is primary. Whereas doubly over here, the carbon that is bonded to OH is further bonded to three carbon atoms over here. So this turns out to be a tertiary alcohol. So V and W both react with sodium metal. Now, the reaction of V over here with sodium metal would look something like this. We have CH3, CH2, 2, CH2OH. This is V. When it reacts with sodium metal, it's going to give us two products. Uh, the first product will be a salt, including the sodium ion. So we have CH3, CH2, just going to write the 3 over here, followed by O negative, Na positive. So you have sodium ions and you have this anion over here, which uh, ends with an O over here with a negative charge. So this is oxide. And it has four carbon atoms, one plus three, that's four. So this becomes butoxide, right? So the name of the salt is sodium butoxide and the other product is hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas obviously can be detected if you hold a burning matchstick above the reaction flask. The hydrogen will extinguish that matchstick with a pop. So name a reagent used to distinguish V from W. Now, V, a primary alcohol, can be oxidized, but W, being a tertiary alcohol, cannot. So we use a uh, reagent such as KMnO4 or K2Cr2O7. Let's just go with KMnO4, which is acidified, of course. And the observation with V would be that it goes from purple the color of KMnO4 to colorless. That's what happens when KMnO4 oxidizes the primary alcohol V.
but with W, because there's no oxidation taking place, so there will be no change observed. So over here we have propanvanol, which is a primary alcohol, over here. And we have a sequence of reactions leading from this particular alcohol. So for reaction number one over here, we are converting the alcohol into a carboxylic acid with this COOH group. And because it has three carbon atoms, so this is going to be propanoic acid. So in order to get uh, propanoic acid from propanvanol, we're going to use an oxidizing agent such as uh, acidified potassium dichromate 6. That could be K2Cr2O7. And we're going to use heat, but this is just asking us for suitable reagents, right? Now for reaction 2 over here, you're converting the alcohol into an aldehyde because it has not a COOH, but just COH. This is containing three carbon atoms as well, so this becomes propanol. So to get propanol, again, you're going to use an oxidizing agent such as acidified K2Cr2O7. Now, stating explain how the reaction should be carried out to ensure that reaction 2 rather than reaction 1 occurs. So for reaction 1, you would want to heat under reflux, right? So that the entire alcohol is converted, fully oxidized to the carboxylic acid. But if you want to stop midway and get to propanol, you will want to heat the alcohol with the oxidizing agent, uh, followed by quick distillation of the product of the aldehyde so that it does not react further. And the reason why you get an aldehyde first followed by a carboxylic acid, why the carboxylic acid is the fully oxidized form is because in propanol um, you just have COH and if you get an extra oxygen in between carbon and oxygen, uh, carbon and hydrogen here, so this becomes a carboxylic acid group rather than an aldehyde group. So identify the necessary reagents and conditions for the other two reactions, three and four. For reaction three over here, what is happening basically is that you have propanvanol CH3, CH2, CH2OH. So the OH over here is being eliminated alongside a hydrogen from the neighboring carbon atom, so water is being removed. So this is actually a dehydration reaction. And uh, the two carbon atoms, the one bonded to OH and the neighboring carbon atom get a double bond between them. So this becomes an alkene over here. This is propene, right? So for reaction three, you could either use concentrated H2SO4 as a dehydrating agent, or you could use Al2O3, aluminum oxide, plus heat. All right. Now for reaction four, basically you're converting the alcohol into a halogenoalkane, so the OH is being replaced with a Br over here. So for this, you could use phosphorus tribromide PBr3 also known as phosphorus 3 bromide alongside some heat. This will convert your alcohol into a bromoalkane. This will just be 1 bromopropane. So now let's get on to carboxylic acids. So we have C over here that contains both an alcohol group and the carboxylic acid group right here. So the carboxylic acid reacts with sodium carbonate to give you E. So now there are going to be three products. One of them is CO2, one of them is H2O, and the third is a salt. Now the salt is basically what they're referring to over here, draw the structure of E. So for this we have OH that does not react, 
that we have CH2 and then C double bond O, single bond O. Now this is going to be a negative ion and sodium is going to be the positive ion in this salt, this ionic compound that results from this reaction. All right. Now suggest why NaBH4 is not a suitable reagent to make F from C. So F over here is basically CH2OH2, right? So one CH2OH is over here. Now this COOH is basically converted into CH2OH because this oxygen from the carbon oxygen double bond reacts with hydrogen to make water that is removed. The carbon atom needs to form two bonds and it forms them with two hydrogen atoms. So basically this is a reduction reaction taking place with four hydrogen atoms being gained. All right. And NaBH4 is a reducing agent that's not strong enough, right? Not strong enough reducing agent. A stronger reducing agent to convert a carboxylic acid group to an alcohol group, specifically a primary alcohol group, would be LiAlH4. So construct an equation for the reaction of F, which is CH2OH2, to make G. And for this, we have SOCl2. We are converting the alcohol to a halogen alkane. The OH is being replaced with a Cl this time. So what happens is you have CH2OH2. So two OH groups are being replaced. So we will need two SOCl2 molecules. So what happens over here is that in the OH group, the hydrogen will react with one of the CLs to make 8Cl, right? And uh, the other CL will obviously take the place of OH in the uh, final product. So this is going to be CH2Cl2. So obviously there's going to be two 8Cl because there's two OH groups being talked about. And then we have the O from the OH that reacts with SO over here to make SO2, sulfur dioxide. So this is the reaction to produce the chloroalkane from the alcohol. So under appropriate conditions, ethanol and propanoic acid undergo a condensation reaction, right? So what happens here is that you have ethanol. So the skeletal formula would be CH3, CH2, OH. This reacts with propanoic acid. So this is going to be OH, C double bond O, CH2, CH3, right? So we have one, two, three carbon atoms. So this is propanoic acid. So when these two react, the OH from the carboxylic acid and the H from the alcohol, these react to form water which is the byproduct. This is the condensation product, basically, right? And these two guys will get together and you will get CH3, CH2, O. Then this is going to be C double bond O, CH2, CH3. And uh, this is basically an ester. And how do we know this is an ester? Because of the C double bond O, single bond O functional group. Now, if I want to convert this ester back into alcohol and carboxylic acid, the reverse of this reaction is going to be known as hydrolysis, right? So what happens is that the car carbon oxygen single bond, it breaks and it reacts with water. Hydrolysis is the breakdown by water. The H from H2O will react with the alcohol part and the OH from H2O will react with the carboxylic acid part to remake the alcohol and carboxylic acid. So this is hydrolysis. And the forward reaction that we looked at earlier was esterification. And this is a condensation reaction. And for this, the condition necessary is concentrated H2SO4 as a catalyst alongside some heating. And the organic product of this reaction 
is basically going to be ethyl propanoate. So basically how we name this depends on what went into making the ester. Ethyl comes from the alcohol ethanol and propanoate comes from the carboxylic acid, which is propanoic acid. All right, let's talk about aldehydes and ketones now. We have seven reaction types listed. So name the type of reaction involved with Tollens reagent is used to identify an aldehyde. So Tollens reagent is basically silver nitrate, AgNO3, that is dissolved in ammonia, right? So I'm going to just write this as AMM, dissolved in ammonia. So what happens over here is that an aldehyde, which is basically C double bond O, is bonded to a hydrogen, this gets oxidized to a carboxylic acid. This gets oxidized to a carboxylic acid, which then further reacts with the ammonia in which the AgNO3 is dissolved. And so this H plus is gained by the base, which is ammonia. And this will give us a carboxylate ion, COO negative plus NH4 positive. So this is what happens with the aldehyde. It gets oxidized. So this will be an oxidation reaction for the aldehyde. And at the same time, the silver ions in silver nitrate, they gain an electron each, and this makes silver metal. And this silver metal is observed as a silver mirror. That gives us the positive result for an aldehyde. This does not work for ketones, just for aldehydes. Name the type of reaction involved in the test for a carbonyl group using 2,4-DNPH. Now, 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine over here, it's basically hydrazine, regular hydrazine, which is two NH2 groups bonded together. So you have an NH2 over here. And over here, instead of having regular NH2, one of the hydrogens is replaced by this part of the molecule, which is 2,4-DNP, right? Don't need to go into the details of this for AS level. So 2,4-DNP. Just going to draw this using a box over here that's bonded to the nitrogen. Now, when this reacts with a carbonyl group, now remember, carbonyl compounds are both aldehydes and ketones. Now, if it is bonded on both sides, the C double bond O is bonded on both sides by a alkyl group, this is going to be a ketone. And if instead of um, one of these alkyl groups, I have a hydrogen atom, this is going to be an aldehyde. So in either case, what happens is the two hydrogen atoms from the regular NH2 group in 2,4-DNPH reacts with oxygen in the carbonyl group, and this is condensed out as H2O. And the nitrogen atom and the carbon atom here, they form a double bond between themselves, and so this becomes NH, and I have 2,4-DNP over here. The rest of the molecule we don't need to know about for now. And then we have N, double bond C, this is going to be R prime and R, or instead of R prime, you could have H if this is an aldehyde. This over here is your orange precipitate that confirms that you have a carbonyl group present. So this type of reaction would then be a condensation reaction. So name the type of reaction involved in the reaction of a ketone with NABH4. So NABH4, we've seen this before, this is a reducing agent, right? So reducing agent uh, reacts with the ketone. We have two R groups bonded to the carbonyl group, C double bond O. This reacts with H such that the oxygen, it combines with an H over here. This pi bond breaks and the carbon over here bonds with the H itself as well. And so the carbon bonded to OH over here bonded to two alkyl groups. So this is a secondary alcohol. By the way, secondary alcohol can be oxidized to a ketone as well. So the reverse works as well. So this is a reduction reaction at the reverse going from secondary alcohol to a ketone would be oxidation. 
Name the type of reaction involved in the reaction of an aldehyde with HCN. So basically, in this reaction, we'll look at it in detail further um, in another question, but this is basically an addition reaction. This is a nucleophilic addition reaction that we will look at in detail in another question. So over here we have P and Q, two aldehydes or ketones or whatever they are, that contain this molecular formula C3H6O. They both form an orange precipitate when reacted with 2,4 DNPH. This basically orange precipitate tells us that we have a carbonyl group. Now we do not know for sure whether this carbonyl group is going to be part of an aldehyde or ketone functional group. It says only Q produces a yellow precipitate when reacted with alkaline aqueous iodine. So this yellow precipitate over here is basically going to be triiodomethane, which is CHI3. So over here we write the answer. The yellow precipitate is CHI3, and this is triiodomethane. And what happens over here is that this basically confirms that Q contains a group that is CH3, C double bond O, right? So it contains this group. Basically what happens over here is that uh, the CH3 is converted into CI3 by the substitution of iodine from the alkaline aqueous iodine. And then what happens is that this carbon-carbon single bond, it is broken and it undergoes hydrolysis because of the aqueous part of the solution. So H goes to the CI3 part, the OH goes to the C double bond O, and so we get CHI3, which is triiodomethane, the yellow precipitate, and the rest of the molecule becomes a carboxylic acid so we have HO C double bond O and this by the way this reacts with the alkaline part uh, the OH negative ions present gave the H plus from the carboxylic acid and so this becomes H2O and a carboxylate ion so O negative C double bond O then the rest of the molecule right so Q contains CH3C double bond O so we write this as CH3CO. Now we need to compare with the rest of the molecular formula. We have gotten rid of one O and uh, we've gotten rid of three hydrogens, right? So you have three left and we have one carbon atom left. So that's going to be CH3. So this is simply going to be propanone, right? You have a ketone with three carbon atoms. Now, P does not react to form a yellow precipitate with alkaline aqueous iodine, so we need to make sure that the C double bond O is not bonded to any CH3s, right? So the only other option we have left is an aldehyde. So we have CH3, CH2, CHO, right? The CHO is the aldehyde group, right? So this is going to be propanol, right? This is an aldehyde with the C double bond O bonded to a, an ethyl group, CH3CH2, and a hydrogen atom. So ethanol over here, which is another aldehyde, it also reacts with hydrogen cyanide. The product of this reaction is this guy over here. It has two functional groups. You have an alcohol group, OH, and you have a nitrile group, C triple bond N. So draw the mechanism of this reaction. Now, remember we were talking about the reaction of uh, an aldehyde with HCN that was an addition reaction. Now, the mechanism for this reaction is going to be nucleophilic addition. So this is going to be nucleophilic addition. So in this uh, scenario, what happens is you have CH3, C double bond O, single bond H. You have the C double bond O, which has a partial positive carbon, partial negative oxygen. Now the partial positive carbon is electron deficient and is going to be attacked by a nucleophile. 
Now in this case, the nucleophile is going to be a cyanide ion. So this is C triple bond N, a carbon contains a lone pair and it has a negative charge. So we're going to show a curly arrow going from the lone pair on the negative carbon to the partial positive carbon atom in the um, aldehyde. And the carbon oxygen a double bond will be converted into a single bond. The pi bond undergoes heterolytic fission. Both electrons in the pi bond go to the partial negative oxygen atom. So this basically results in the formation of an intermediate. So we have CH3, C single bond O, the oxygen gave both electrons in the pi bond, so it has a negative charge. We have C triple bond N over here, and we have H. So this over here, this intermediate is called a carb anion. So this is the opposite of a carbocation. It has a negative charge now, so it is an anion. Now this will react with hydrogen cyanide over here. Oxygen carries a lone pair, the negatively charged oxygen. It will attack the partial positive hydrogen in the hydrogen cyanide. The movement of an electron pair from the negative oxygen to the partial positive hydrogen. This is partial negative here. And so this results in CH3. And by the way, this hydrogen carbon single bond undergoes heterolytic fission. The carbon gets both electrons in this bond pair. So we have OH over here. We have C triple bond N over here. And we have H. So this over here, this compound is called a hydroxy nitrile because it has an OH, which is hydroxy, and the nitrile group. If I want to name this, I have three carbon atoms in the longest carbon chain. I'm going to uh, number the carbon atom part of the nitrile group as number one. It's going to be number two, number three. So the hydroxy side chain is bonded to carbon atom number two. So this becomes two hydroxy. And because we have three carbon atoms, so this is going to be propane nitrile. All right, and uh, another product that you get is the cyanide ion has been regenerated. So basically the cyanide ion, this is a catalyst. It comes from NaCN, sodium cyanide, or potassium cyanide, right, which is behaving as a catalyst. We can see it's behaving as a catalyst because it was consumed in the first step and it was regenerated in the second step. So it sped up the reaction and the actual reactant that was uh, reacted with the aldehyde in this addition reaction was the hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide contains only partial charges, so it is not a very strong nucleophile, but the cyanide ion has a proper negative charge, which makes it a strong nucleophile. All right, finally, let's talk about isomerism. So this question is about molecules with molecular formula C4H8. So give the structures of a pair of positional isomers with the formula C4H8. So positional isomers are isomers that contain the same functional group, but at different positions along the carbon chain. So C4H8, this fits in with the general formula of an alkene, right? So we will have the carbon carbon double bond as the functional group. So this can be in two possible positions. So let's draw these structures over here. So first possible structure is the carbon carbon double bond being at carbon atom number one. Then we have two other carbon atoms. And so we have two hydrogens, one, two, three, All right? So we have this particular structure which will be called but one ene because you have four carbon atoms so that's but it's an alkene so ene and in between these two parts we have the position of the carbon carbon double bond which will basically be but one ene all right so fill in the hydrogen atoms this is very important right now for the next one i can draw the 
carbon carbon double bond as being between atoms number two and three. So this will actually be butene because that's where the double bond starts, right? So this becomes CH3, this becomes CH, this becomes CH, and this becomes CH3. So give the structures of a pair of chain isomers with the formula C4H8 that do not exhibit stir isomerism, right? So we need two chain isomers. Chain isomers are basically, um, they have a difference in the number of carbon atoms in the longest carbon chain. They can or maybe they might not even have side chains. It really depends, right? So one example is but1ene again because this does not show stereoisomerism because the two carbon atoms in the double bond are not bonded to two different groups each. Well, this one is, but this one is bonded to two hydrogen atoms that are the same as each other. So this will not show uh, any form of stereoisomerism. So I will just draw butuanine again. It's going to be CH2, double bond CH, CH2 and CH3 over here. Now the other uh, isomer over here, what we can do is we can uh, have three carbon atoms in the main branch and one carbon atom in a side chain. So we going to draw three carbon atoms here and one carbon atom here, right? So this is going to be CH3 then. And I could place the double bond either between these two carbon atoms or these two, it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to place it over here and uh, single bond here. This becomes CH3. This, be this is not bonded to any hydrogens and this is bonded to two. So this over here is a chain isomer. It has three carbon atoms in the main branch. This has four carbon atoms. So there's a difference in the number of carbon atoms in the main branch. So that's chain isomerism. So give the structures and full names of a pair of stereoisomers with the formula C4H8. So we need a carbon-carbon double bond with both carbon atoms bonded to two different groups. So in this case, I will have a hydrogen and a CH3. And this is bonded to a hydrogen and a CH3. So in case you have forgotten already, this is the same structure, just drawn in a slightly different way as of but to in right so because the same groups are on the same side of the carbon carbon double bond right each carbon atom is bonded to one hydrogen and both hydrogens are on the same side of the carbon carbon double bond and you could say the same about the ch3s over here so this over here is going to be called cis but to in And uh, the other isomer is basically just rotating one of the carbon atoms such that CH3 and H switch positions. The other carbon atom with its groups of atoms that it is bonded to remain in the same place. So you have a hydrogen over here on this side and a hydrogen on this side of the carbon-carbon double bond. These are basically... Um, diagonally placed from each other you can say the same about the ch3s so this is going to be the trans isomer so this is trans but to e so the type of stereoisomerism shown here is geometrical isomerism right so this is geometrical stereoisomers so the structure of a molecule a of formula c4h8 is shown so over here, you can see there are no carbon-carbon double bonds, but the formula is C4H8. This actually is a cycloalkane. In this case, this is going to be cyclobutane because you have four carbon atoms. So you have cyclobutane. And this is a cyclic structure, right? Carbon atoms at the end of a regular butane molecule got bonded together and you got cyclobutane, right? So we need a functional group isomer of this. A functional group isomer is basically a molecule with the same molecular formula, uh, but different functional group, right? So in this case, uh, the easy solution for the um, cyclobutane having a functional group isomer is a regular alkene. 
So I'm just going to go once again with butte one in, right? So I have butte one in over here, and that's that, right? Now explain how molecules A and B could be distinguished by a chemical test. Now we know that the butte one in over here B has a carbon-carbon double bond. And so this can be tested using bromine water. So bromine water or aqueous bromine, uh, it goes from orange to colorless. Basically the color fades or you could say bromine water is decolorized by B. So aqueous bromine is decolorized, decolorized by B, but not A. All right. So let's move on. The product of reaction to but one in. So again, we're talking about but one in over here. It does not show stereoisomerism. We've seen why. However, but one in reacts with HCl to form a mixture of structural isomers X and Y. Right. So explain the meaning of the term stereoisomers. So stereoisomers, in case you haven't already figured out, these are compounds with the same molecular and structural formula right but they have different arrangements of atoms in space so same molecular and structural formally but different arrangements of atoms in space right so give two reasons why butene does not show stereoisomerism. So first reason is that the carbon-carbon double bond uh, contains carbon atoms not bonded to two different groups. Because if they are bonded to the same group, that is one carbon atom in the double bond is bonded to the same atom or group of atoms, um, twice, then it will not show geometrical or cis-trans isomerism, right? So it contains C atoms not bonded to two different groups. And the other type of stereoisomerism is optical isomerism. This involves a chiral center, right? And I'll explain what that means. Um, basically, it is a carbon atom that's bonded to four different groups of atoms altogether. So that chiral carbon atom is not found in butene. in does not contain a chiral center. Right, so name X and Y. So X over here exists as a pair of stereoisomers that is produced in higher yield than Y, right? So you have butene-ene over here, so we have CH2, double bond, CH, but this is CH2, CH3. So when this reacts with HCl, then uh, the higher yield product will follow Markovnikov's rule that we've already seen. This double bond becomes a single bond, and this is bonded to hydrogen because this carbon atom is already bonded to more hydrogen atoms, and this gets bonded to Cl. So carbon atom number two over here is bonded to the Cl, so this will be 2-chlorobutane because you have four carbon atoms, so that's butane. Y will basically swap the positions of the H and the Cl that have been added, so this will become 1-chlorobutane. So name the type of stereoisomerism shown by X. Now, this carbon atom over here, carbon atom number two in X, is bonded to a hydrogen, a CH2, CH3, a CH3 over here, and a Cl. So these are four different groups. So this carbon atom is known as a chiral center. It is bonded to four different atoms or groups. And so the type of stereoisomerism showed by X when you have a chiral center is known as optical isomerism. So use the conventional representation to draw the two stereoisomers of X. So you draw the carbon atom, which is the chiral center in, of course, the center. It's bonded to a hydrogen. 
is bonded to a Cl. And uh, because this carbon atom is bonded to four different groups of atoms, so we will show a tetrahedral shape. Four bond pairs and no lone pairs, so that's tetrahedral. So one bond coming out of the screen. So let's say this is bonded to CH3. And one bond going into the screen, that is going to be CH2, CH3. Now, optical isomers, because they contain chiral centers, they can have non-superimposable mirror images that are known as optical isomers. So to draw the mirror image, you have this dotted line, the mirror plane, right? And on the other side of the mirror plane, you will show the mirror image. So the carbon atom is bonded to a hydrogen. It's bonded to a Cl that is going away from the mirror, just like over here, it's going away from the mirror. The CH3 is going towards the mirror, same case as in the previous optical isomer. So you have CH3, and you have CH2, CH3 also going towards the mirror. So CH3, CH2, right? So these are non-superimposable mirror images, just like your left and right hand. They are mirror images of each other that cannot be put on top of each other and be called identical to each other, right? So these are optical isomers of 2-chlorobutane, which is X. Now, one type of question that comes up uh, more often in the MCQ paper is regarding chiral centers in cyclic rings, right? So, first of all, the type of carbonyl group over here, the C double bond O is bonded to two carbon atoms, one here and one here. This basically is a CH3 group. So this is going to be a ketone, so it's going to be either of these two options, right? Now, to find a, a chiral center here, this is obviously not chiral because it is bonded to three hydrogens. This carbon atom in the carbonyl group is not chiral either because it is not bonded to four atoms. Now, let's take a look at all of these other carbon atoms in the cyclic ring. So this this and this neither of these is chiral because they're both bonded to two hydrogen atoms right you see two carbon carbon bonds single and you have these two hydrogen carbon bonds that are not visible right so because these two are the same as each other they are not four different um, atoms or groups that are bonded to the carbon so these are not chiral centers these two carbon atoms are part of a double bond, so they're automatically ruled out. That leaves this guy over here. So now this carbon atom is bonded to a hydrogen that's not shown. It's bonded to C double bond O CH3, two different groups so far. Now, since it's part of the ring, what we will do is draw a line from this carbon atom to the opposite carbon atom in the ring and see whether this is a line of symmetry or not. So you have CH2, CH2 on this side, and you have CH double bond, CH on this side. This is not a line of symmetry, and so this guy over here is going to be a chiral center. So you have just one chiral center in this, and so it's going to be option D. And we are done, finally. That was almost 90 minutes of AS level organic chemistry. Uh, we looked at all of the major concepts and reaction mechanisms from hydrocarbons to carbonyl compounds and everything in between. And uh, inshallah, I will be including uh, chapters in the description so that you can skip to whichever topic you want to revise. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, please do like, share this video and subscribe to the channel. And if you like this format of revision, do let me know in the comments so that I may make more such videos in the future. Inshallah, I'll see you in the next video.